Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me um, this wonderful week. I am joined here by Hamad Nasser, who, for those of you who do not know, you will get to know somebody very interesting who has a very um, a brilliant career behind them and ahead of them. And it's wonderful to hear um, Hamad talk generally. And I'm so happy that he has agreed to join me today. Hamad is a London-based curator, a writer, a researcher, and a strategic advisor. He is Senior Research Fellow at the Paul Mellon Center, and he's Principal Research Fellow at the University of the Arts London. In addition, Hamad is co-curator of the British Art Show Number no. 9 for this year, which is Britain's largest exhibition of contemporary art, and it takes place once every five years. Hamad was the inaugural executive director of the Stuart Hall Foundation. He was also head of research and programs prior to this, of course, of the Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, before which he was um, the co-director and the co-founder of the Green Cardamom, a gallery and art foundation based in London from 2004 to 2012 with Anita Daoud. He has curated more than 30 exhibitions and projects at numerous international institutions and significant public exhibitions which are often accompanied by book catalogs include speech acts, reflection, imagination, repetition. I'm not going to read all of these, but they are a lot. Um, they also include rock, paper, scissors, positions in play in 2017, which was actually the UAE's pavilion at the Venice Biennale, which Hamad curated, and he's going to talk about that later as well. Lines of control, partition as a productive space from 2005 to 2013. So this was a longer project, and Hamad's going to talk a little bit about this as well. Drawn from Life 2011, where three dreams cross 150 years of photography from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh and Karkhana, a contemporary collaboration. Now, Hamad is also a member of the board of Mufradat. Is that how you say it, Hamad? I'm afraid Mufradat. I may have butchered Dad. that. Mufradat. No, not too right. And of the editorial board of the Tate's magazine, Tate, etc. He's also served on several juries and boards and in advisory roles for numerous international organizations, including Art Basel Switzerland, the British Council, Delfina Foundation, you the don't Manchester need to Art let, Gallery. Go through all of that, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's extremely impressive, and it's very helpful to know all of this, to know that you have this very strong background behind of you. Now, um, let's delve right into it and dive right in. Hamad, I wanted to ask you, first of all, about your unique approach towards curating, which you have spoken about in the past. And I was wondering whether you wanted to talk a little bit about that. I know that you see curating as a very heavily research-based um, practice, and that has sort of driven most of the projects that you've done. I was wondering whether you wanted to ask, Ellie, like, sort of speak about that. Sure. Um, I think, I mean, if you'd carried on reading, uh, uh, people <laughs> who don't know uh, me would also find out that I have a, I have a misspent youth in, in financial and professional services. So I trained as an accountant, was a banker, a management consultant. And then I entered the art world sort of laterally. So I took the scenic route in. Um, so I often sort of preface things by saying, you know, my, my ignorance is vast and growing. Uh, and thus, you know, so for me, um, when I entered the art world, it was as a writer and as a critic. Um, and then, you know, so it was a simple enough task in a way to say, okay, well, what is this artwork or an exhibition doing to me, you know, and how, uh, how do I, how does it make me feel and what, you know, and what do I think about it? Um, that was personal. So when you started making exhibitions, um, I sort of carried on with that approach, which was an approach that says, okay, this is an opportunity to actually ask some questions. And, and a mm -hmm. bit like what you're doing now, it's, you know, I mean, I mean, you could have, you could have done this all by yourself where you're just sort of holding forth, but I'm sure you find it more interesting to talk to people. And okay. I think of the exhibition platform as something like that. You know, it's an opportunity to hold a series of moderated conversations um, with, with, with people that you, you, you can learn from, you can collaborate with, you can, you know, research alongside. So a lot of my, um, I mean, virtually all of my exhibitions of any substantial scale uh, are, are almost always co-curated or curated with other people. Because um, the whole point for me in making an exhibition is I've got a, I've got, you know, I've got an itch that I need to scratch. Um, although this doesn't sound very hygienic, but I want other people along, you know, so it's, it's, it's a bit about, 
um, I want people along who will who are either uh, bring something different to uh, to the table. That makes complete sense. And also, I do have to say one thing. I do not for one moment believe that your youth was misspent. I think that a lot of the <laughs> strategic and analytical approach that you do have towards art, um, art exhibitions, art making, art critique as well, probably comes out of your training of looking at things and questioning them and thinking about how perhaps things work in a way as well. And I think that's really important. I believe you should not have regrets in life. I think everything no, sort no, of no, adds no, to no, your I, journey. Yeah, and, you know, no. I think that, you know, that that's wonderful. Now, tell me about what you are doing right now. It sounds as though you are dealing and juggling many very interesting and important balls in the air. Very, you have three diverse roles going on. Obviously, they're all in the art world, but it would be wonderful to hear a little bit more about them. So shall we start with the British Art Show? Um, sure. Could you tell me a little bit about that? How did you get involved? What is what is the British Art Show for those of us who do not know? Um, well, the British Art Show, and I think you sort of uh, laid out a very good sort of introduction, is it's kind of the largest uh, recurring exhibition of contemporary art in Britain. It happens every five years. I'm co-curating British Art Show 9. Um, mm. which was supposed to open just next month. Thank, you know, it's not. It's now, it's thanks to COVID-19, which now been pushed till March. Um, mm. And then it will tour for uh, to three other cities. So it, it goes to four cities every time. And okay. the idea behind it is that it's really kind of a, um, a survey of, well, what is, what is important and significant and current uh, in contemporary art today? Uh, in in this country, how exciting! It is, and it's um, I'm co-curating and, and it vast the, as well. Like oh, it's quite a responsibility. Completely. No, no, I mean it's um, um, well, it's not something you can do yourself. I think no. uh, so. As I'm co-curating this with Irene Aristasabal um, and a wonderful team at uh, Hayward Gallery Touring, um, and I sort of describe this as a kind of an it's, it's an exhausting privilege. Um, and I use both those terms um, advisedly, privilege, because as, as, you, as you said, I mean, it is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and, and it was also, um, you know, we came back to the UK after a time in Hong Kong in sort of 2016, really since 2017 professionally after my um, sort of Venice Biennale uh, and, and then to within a couple of years to have this possibility to curate um, the British art show was amazing because it's quite a way to come back in. So, you know, being out of the country for five, five and a half years or so. Uh, and then to say, right, you know, now you're, you, you're going to do a survey of, uh, of what is current um, in British art is, is just an amazing opportunity. And, um, and over last year, so, I think we spent most of like sort of November 2018 to like December 2019 traveling. Mm. Um, so Irene and I uh, and quite often accompanied by at least one or if not more um, colleagues from Hayward Gallery Touring. Uh, we have done about 250 or so our studio visits. Um, with that is artists amazing. In wow. 23 cities. You know, uh, I was going to ask you, yeah. tell me about the most interesting, I mean, you must have gone to such exciting cities as well. I mean, places that a lot of people may not have visited um, in Britain and the EU. Sure. I mean, is, is it mean, spread, the, sorry, just to interrupt, is it spread yeah. um, th throughout the UK? So it's Scotland and... Yeah. Um, well, let me dial back. So, so the four cities yeah. <laughs> um, are, uh, it's going to open in Wolverhampton. Okay. It will then move to Aberdeen um, in Scotland, then go goes right down south to uh, to Plymouth, um, mm. and now it will end in Manchester. So, so we've very done a little different bit audiences. Very different audiences, and almost BBC-like um, sort of um, fairness to Brexit voting cities, to sort of Remain cities. Um, so very you well know. <laughs> Well balanced, and then actually two cities um, I hadn't actually been to. Uh, so neither Rainey or I had, had actually been to either Wolverhampton or Plymouth before we we were um, selected for this uh, for this opportunity. And the same exhibition will travel exactly the same. So the same artists, the same artworks. They won't change them up for each city. Well, 
No, that's so. So that's one of the things. Um, and I mean, this this is one of being a sort of um, a, a bugbear of mine, which is you know this idea of the touring show. Um, mm. is, if, if I've um, and and I've sort of had iterative shows, but I've always questioned what what does it mean to just have something which just simply tours. Um, you know, so neither of us were really interested in having, you know, kind of a flying saucer that lands on a field yeah. uh, that people come and admire it and then it flies off and lands somewhere else for three months. Uh, so for us, it felt really important, as you pointed out, that those cities are so different. Mm -hmm. uh, they have very different histories, very different types of institutions. Um, and so, so, for example, in Aberdeen, we are being hosted by one, you know, the Aberdeen Art Gallery. Um, which has had a major new refurb, but it's one place and it's the central uh, art gallery. Um, in, in Manchester, we have uh, five art uh, institutions that are, that are hosting us, uh, potentially six. In Plymouth, wow. again, again, we have five. In Wolverhampton, we're being hosted by the City Art Gallery and the City Art School. Um, so these are very different places, very different histories, different types of infrastructure. Lots to navigate. Lots to navigate. And, and you know, just to make our life um, a bit more difficult, you know, we sort of taken the approach that, no, these are going to be uh, substantially different exhibitions. Of course, there is a core of artists. Uh, I mean, they're all there. But the show is not such which is like a hub and spoke thing. You know, it's mm. not like here is a core and here is extra. Uh, it'll be different. It, it's to say that you can, it's a cumulative idea. So that you can't just sort of go to one place and consume the British mm -hmm. art show. Um, it's the British art show is actually all of the things that that will be. So in the four different cities, the performances, the films, uh, and I don't think anybody will, will be able to see it all. Uh, and that's actually okay. So the idea <laughs> is not that you have, so, oh, no, no, you must, you've started, so you must finish. Um, the, the idea behind it is the possibility that your uh, consumption or your sort of experience of the exhibition will be very different from mine. Mm -hmm. And both of them are valid. And, and maybe, exactly. you know, together we can sort of create, it's a bit like the nation, you know, the nation yeah. itself. Is, is the product of, uh, of the imagination. You know, the, these things don't exist. They're kind of, uh, they have to be shaped and created. So that, that way, very I think exciting. We were, we're interested in having a show that kind of reflects that. And Hama, tell me, I mean, I know you mentioned that the, most of the artists will be at each one, but how many artists in total are you looking at? You mentioned 250 studio visits, but how yeah, many yeah. of those so, are you actually selecting? So, so there are 47 artists. We've just Wonderful. announced um, the list. Yes. Um, just um, just a few weeks ago, um, 47 artists and, and they've been sort of grouped in three major sort of clusters, really. And these are not sort of this is not a thematic show in that, uh, you know, here is an idea that we had and let's go find artists that mm. will fit that idea. Rather, we went and did these studio visits. And then sat back and reflected on us to say, okay, what are the so currents on? that we see that, that are happening? And after much debate and discussion, we sort of came across, you know, we divided it into three clusters. The first is, you know, healing, care, and reparative history. Hmm. Um, the second is around tactics for togetherness. And the third is around imagining new futures. And then we used those three as kind of frames with which to then kind of select um, the, the artist, finalize the, the artist list. And it's that so was, perfect as you can for imagine, this moment. Oh, com you know. Like uh, not just the last couple of years, but particularly what's happening right now as well. Well, you can imagine, Zara, this, this list was supposed to be announced um, the end of March. Mm. So, you know, everything, the list was prepared, we were drafting the press release, and suddenly you have the entire world locking down. Yeah. And then sort of most of the Hayward staff go on furlough, and, you know, and then oh, it's like, God, okay, yeah. we're... And then for a moment, we had this little, little panic uh, about saying, oh my God, all that work, um, is that, you know, is that going to be irrelevant? And then we sat back and just looked at those three terms and said, actually, you know, that romantic Perfect. notion of the artist having, you know, kind of surfing the future, of which I, I must hold up my hand, was, um, 
was deeply skeptical of originally. Really? I'm, no, I, I believe in I'm that. I'm now I believe a believer. <laughs> after, especially after this series yeah. of conversations, it's pretty incredible yeah. how artists do foretell the future. Um, wow. And tell me, are there new commissions for this show or are you using previous work? Are they making work according to the theme or just according to whatever they generally do? Well, again, so the idea was this, you know, I mean, didn't go to anybody with a theme. So, yeah. uh, so these, this sort of, uh, this clusters have actually come out of the works already. Okay. Now it's, many people are doing new works. Um, mm. This is, it's, it's a public show. And I think you're familiar enough with the UK public art scene. So no, that means very small budgets, uh, yes. even on a show like this. So, but, you know, we have been able to get some support from places like the Art Fund, um, Fantastic. And um, the cities themselves are sort of, you know, super excited and super sort of committed, I think, especially in these times. Mm. It felt, it, you know, it feels really important that we have something towards the future. And I firmly believe um, that right now, um, you know, the future has to be imagined. You know, it's not going to be just an extension of the past. And, and therefore, artists have some real, you know, they have some real value to to add to all of us you know so to to actually to play a, an active role in that reimagining no they really do you're completely right but what a great way to also sort of see a broad scope of artists from the uk and really delve into their practices analyze things and that sort of goes in a way hand in hand with something else that you're doing which is the london asia project at the paul mellon center and I thought we could maybe chat about that for a little while. Sure. Uh, so, in fact, there, you know, all of these things um, are kind of like Russian dolls. They all fit inside mm. each other. Yes. Um, and the London Asia project um, and um, and actually the exhibition that I think, you know, that got me nominated for the British Art Show. Because, I mean, you're kind of, you're not, you don't, you don't apply for this. You're kind of nominated uh, and then if you're then nominated, then you have to sort of submit a proposal and the shortlisting, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the, um, what I did uh, a few years ago was gave, gave a talk at a conference. Um, you know, I've often described some of the work that we were doing at Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong is to kind of throw little firecrackers in the street. You know, mm -hmm. you just, it goes off and you interrupt the flow of people and people come to the window to see, oh, well, what's going on? You know, who's making that noise? And, and that's that kind of disruption, that possibility to interrupt your sort of, you know, um, status quo uh, that I'm interested in. And I think the work that, that actually history writing is, because histories are not facts, they're stories, okay. they're narratives. Um, and, and the role of research, of, of archives is to, you know, is to question and intervene in, in the current stories and hopefully shape new ones. Mm -hmm. um, so back in 2015, while I was still at um, Asia Ar Archive, um, I wanted to sort of uh, have one of these little firecrackers. And, and what I chose as the subject um, was the exhibition that the artist uh, Rashid Arain had curated called The Other Story. Mm -hmm. um, which is really a polemic and polemical intervention in in the history of modern art in, in certainly in the UK, but more widely in the Western canon. Uh, and it was held in um, at the Hayward, as it happens, in, in 1989. And this was for a, for a stream of the conference that the Paul Mellon Center had organized with the Yale Center for British Art talking about British art um, through its exhibitions, you know, so mm. um, 1900 to now. So I presented, a, I, I presented a paper arguing that the other story is haunting British art history. Um, and before you can sort of exercise the ghost, uh, new histories are emerging. So, so uh, around artists that were in the other story. So people like Li Wanxia, or, or Rashid uh, Arain himself. himself. Yeah. So, so there, you know, so new histories are being written out of Taipei, out of Sharjah, out of Karachi, that are then, you know, sort of propelling a narrative which is crowding out the possibility of the the art histories of Britain that have yet mm. to be written. That's quite a bold paper. Well, you know, firecrackers—they need to be. Loud. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, 
And so the idea was, well, how does one address this? Mm. Um, and I read then what I did was to set up a juxt in juxtaposition with this, the migrations into British art uh, at Tate Britain, which was, I think, done in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, as, 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 as an example of a haunting, where mm. literally some of the works that were shown at the South Bank in 1989 had just taken 24 years to tra you know, travel across the river into Millbank. Uh, mm -hmm. But while the works may have gone there, the stories that they are embedded in haven't changed at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so that and was we're the, seeing that sort of across the, the globe, across yeah. everyone. So out of that then came a series of conversations. One was with the Paul Mellon Center, um, who were, you know, uh, who were also, I think, uh, thinking in, in similar lines, and they were interested in how they can sort of expand and challenge the narratives of British art. Um, and the other was um, the artist Sonia Boyce, um, uh, who was leading um, a project called Black Artists and Modernism at oh. UAL. Uh, also saw a version of that talk uh, that I gave at UAL and uh, at Central St. Martins. And, and she then invited me to uh, to curate an exhibition called Speech Acts okay. um, that, that put the collections of, you know, four large uh, collections in Bradford and Manchester uh, in, into conversation. So works that are, you know, often in storage um, and often framed by biography or geography mm -hmm. with quote unquote collection highlights. So, so what happens how, uh, if you have, um, so, uh, you know, a David Hockney, alongside a Rashid Arain and Li Wanxia, all placing themselves in sort of historical dialogue? Or, or where are the histories of abstraction that account for an Aubrey Williams uh, or an Anwar Jalal Shamza um, or a Kim Lim alongside Bridget Riley? Um, and and that, those were the sort of propositions that were coming out. And out of that, I think, came this nomination for the British Art Show and out of that also that, that thing came the London Asia project. So what we mm -hmm. set up initially was a three year project uh, that would look at uh, three different lenses. Uh, so to look at, um, to look at these entanglements, you know, of, of history between Britain and Asia through the lenses of exhibitions, uh, institutions and art schools. And by institutions, this um, is really interested in what I sort of call uh, calling minor institutions. So not the Tates or the National Galleries, mm -hmm. but really places like the Commonwealth Institute uh, or the British Council, mm -hmm. whose work doesn't often even show up in sort of official art histories um, of, of British art or of, of, of anybody's art really, but whose role is actually kind of crucial. It's very important. Um, They've done so much work across the board. I mean, even in Pakistan, the British Council is constantly completely funding completely. things. Mm. Yeah. So, so that was initially a three-year project, and that then got another two-year extension. So Wonderful. now it's supposed to finish next year, and of course, finish in within quote marks because this is not a project that can no, finish it's ongoing. <laughs> you know, in five years. But at least that that shape of it. Uh, so we're we're planning a a conference that will be more like a murmuration of of events than mm. a and, than a physical uh, event given our COVID times, um, but that hopefully then we'll also develop a publication out of it. But I think most important of all is that we're trying to sort of you know socialize a a community uh, of of people and a community of interest uh, and kind of you know, and, and this is now a charged word in uh, in our present times, but kind of infect the field of British art to kind of, you know, challenge it, intervene it and open open it up. And it's important to put different artists who have always been separated by perhaps geographical boundaries that curators have put on them or institutions have put on them together. Because at the end of the day, this isn't the first time the world has been global. The world has been global for a very long time. So influences have moved around constantly and that has complete... led to the creation of art and we so just i think i don't know whether it's easier or whether we forget the influence that different artists living in very different countries or the same one have had on one another during the same time period and it's important to highlight that 
because that completely changes the conversation of art history and the separations that we have enforced upon it. No, no, I'm, uh, completely. And I think it's, you know, it's, um, it's doubly true, if not triply true for, for Britain. <laughs> Definitely. Because, um, you know, I mean, uh, Salman Rushdie, you know, famously said that the problem with the English is that, you know, that they don't know the history because most of it took place elsewhere. Um, and I think that's <laughs> a real clever. issue. That, that is a real issue in that, um, and I've argued in a, in a small sort of uh, piece I wrote for, for, for Tate, etc., uh, arguing that, you know, one of the issues is that you can be English or, or Scottish or, you know, Welsh, but you can't be British if you don't recognize your imperial self or, you know, your Indian self, your Caribbean self. Because um, at the heart of Britain, and you know, as a country of what it is, is 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 empire, um, and and one of the issues that we have uh, or have had for most of the twentieth and, and the early twenty first century, is this misrecognition or this inability um, to to acknowledge uh, or even to look history in the eye. I mean, I've argued that you know, in Britain, we need to be a bit more Germanic about history. Because, you know, I see what my kids are taught in school. And, you know, you have the tutors three times between uh, primary school and when you do A level or, or O levels. But, uh, but what you are taught about empire or, you know, is, is, is tiny. Oh, even now, I thought that there were changes that were happening because I know that no, this no, conversation no. has now been going on for several years where they are talking about how they need to at least they're still not, mostly not, talking. Yeah, they're still oh, mostly talking, and no real and action. No, I mean, there's because I mean, mm. again, because you you get trapped into these cycles, which are because um, everybody knows how to teach the tutors, you know. So, yes. so you can get your A star, or you know, eight points or nine points in 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 GCSEs. But if you are going to take a little elective on migration stories or on empire. Oh my God! Don't know. You know, we can't guarantee mm. little Johnny uh, his eight or nine or his A star. So people don't take that up. Um, that's unfortunate. So, so that's actually, yeah. I mean, that's uh, we can we can get trapped into those projects. But I think that's also that's also the possibility of what art and culture can do. Is okay. I mean, I firmly believe that to actually make change in society. It's, uh, it's culture that enables political change. It's not the other way around. It's not politics that drives culture. It's absolutely the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And while, you know, I'm not one for making heroic claims about, you know, art can change the world. I think art can change people and people can change the world. And we've uh, also seen how artists can be so forward thinking about everything. So I think yeah, certainly. In, in, indeed, indeed. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. In fact, speaking of that a little bit, speaking about culture, speaking about international events and relations as well, I wanted to ask you about the pavilion at Venice that you curated, the UAE Pavilion, which was an amazing feat in 2017. Was this the first time that they were exhibiting or is that not correct? No, no. So this was, um, this was the fifth uh, art okay. pavilion at Venice. So still uh, very new. It was very new, um, and um, and you know, I mean, and it was you know, incredible company. Sort of uh, previous curators had included. Um, I think just before me was um, uh, Sheikh Ahur Al Qasimi. Before that was I think Reem Fada, um, Vasif Khortoum. Uh, so you know, I mean, and and you know, really sort of uh, incredible company. And when I was sort of approached to, you know, will you, again, you get you know, nominated and you get, uh, it's like, will you make a proposal? And, and the person who uh, was running the pavilion, um, and I worked with her before at Third Line, uh, when I was doing lines of control, so an iteration was there. And I said, are you sure? You know, because I mean, you've seen the kind of exhibitions I make. And, you know, if I make a proposal, I'm not going to be proposing just Emirati uh, passport holders, because I think, you know, how do you, how do you sort of represent a nation where 85% of the people are not citizens? Hmm. Um, and, and that felt, you know, like an important issue. I mean, uh, and, and she was like, no, no, what, make the proposals that you want. And, you know, and let's, 
so I made the proposal and I thought I was really pushing the boat out and, you know, nobody blinked. Um, and it was like, yep, yeah, okay, you know, do it. That's brilliant. Yeah. No, and tell was, me, uh, well, I mean, they could obviously see an important proposal and even in 2017, these are, these are important issues to have thought about because that's when I, the migration crisis was also, you know, at its highlight or high point rather. But I think also, I mean, it, uh, it, you know, it also bring or brought home to me that perhaps, you know, uh, I mean, we come to we come to rash judgments about places and people and things. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, things are not all what what you think they are. Uh, and it actually also underlined that possibility for the cultural space as a place where you could have conversations, really difficult conversations that perhaps couldn't be accommodated in other realms, you know? Um, so the fact that, uh, you know, the, the UAE pavilion had uh, Iranians or, um, you know, Indian artists or uh, sort of chi a Chinese-born artist alongside Emirati artists, you know, representing the UAE, it felt like a really important conversation to, had, to be had. Uh, and I think it's also important to recognize that each of those nationalities, all of those people have given the UAE so much. And that no, is also I, why it has reached the stature, the stature that it has. And it's important for the nation to understand that. And I think that's something a lot of other nations are struggling with. Oh, com uh, completely. And I think that was also what interesting for the UAE was to think mm. about what what forms of cosmopolitanism, uh, you know, could, could exist. Um, and I'm not just talking about the kind of simple mercantile cosmopolitanism that you would quite often uh, associate with, say, places like Dubai. Uh, you know, we, we have consumed the kind of a Western uh, idea of history, which, which looks at the cosmopolitan centers as being New York, London, Paris, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe we'll give you Ankara, but in, in between so-and-so date, or Baghdad, but, you know, in the dim distant past. Uh, cosmopolitanism looks like that. Well, what does, you know, I mean, if you look at where are the cosmopolitan centers today or certain types of cosmopolitan centers, I think, you know, uh, places like the UAE or Singapore or, you know, Hong Kong before it started going through what it's going through now. I think th those are interesting possibilities for what cosmopolitanism could be. I'm not sort of now promoting them as like, this is what, what the world should look like, but I'm just saying there are, they are also kind of Petri dishes of how people can come together and, and, and what they can, you know, what shape can that be? No, I completely agree. And I think the centers of the world are constantly changing and in flux. Mm. And I'm actually reading this great book, which I have to confess has taken me several months for some reason. I promise I'm reading other books at the same time, but it's called The Silk Roads. And it's looking oh, yeah. at how previously, um, previously the centers of the world were in the East. And I think it makes complete sense that those go back and forth because the world is quite volatile and it's constantly changing and morphing. And we need to be observant of that and also understand that it is important that other countries, other centers grow and take shape just no, for things completely. to keep moving forward and keep advancing. Now tell yeah, me so, something, how did you, oh sorry to interrupt, what were you saying? No, go, I mean, I was just going to say, well, so when, um, that UA pavilion sort of came out and this idea of nationality and thinking about, well, belonging. Uh, I've been going sort of back and forth uh, with the UAE for about 10 years because I, I actually had the great pleasure and privilege to, to work on the 2007 edition of the Sharjah Biennial. I was sort of assisting one of the curators, Jonathan Watkins, for just a, a few weeks. But that really gave me, you know, lots to think about. And mm. uh, after that, I wrote a little piece talking, uh, you know, observing these three very different approaches that Sharjah, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi are playing. So it was almost like positions, you know? You do uh, artistic practice production, you do collection and display, you do the market, you know? So there were mm -hmm. like these three positions. The other thing that came out of that, that trip was um, uh, one of the curators of that biennial was the artist Mohammed Ghazem. And he'd done a show called, I think it was called Window, uh, 16 UAE artists or 17, you know, UAE artists. Um, and that was my first real sort of exposure to art from that part of the region. Mm. And I was really struck by 
the playfulness of practices. You know, there were performativity, there was charms, there was whimsy. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? You know, why, what have why they got to be? Fun? Why, 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 what is this? <laughs> this is not my association necessarily with, uh, mm. with, 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 with the place. Um, and that had sort of remained with me as this kind of, you know, thread. And then sort of actually by working on the project itself, I sort of actually kind of figured out that what it is about play is that play is a way that you actually perform belonging, you know, you mark territory. Um, so, so we actually for the book, because we use the book as a site for the exhibition itself. So we commissioned uh, the cricket writer, Osman Samiuddin, to talk about, you know, the, about the history of cricket in the UAE, you know, because um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the home of world cricket right now is the UAE. That's where the ICC sits. Um, and while Pakistan, nobody was touring Pakistan, the Pakistan uh, cricket team was at home in the UAE. In the UAE. Mm. Uh, so, so that idea of, uh, and all these sort of labor um, they're playing cricket on the streets, etc. So I think using that as a way to then think about, you know, how does one belong? You know, can you can you belong if you still don't have the passport or if you can't get the passport? How do you mark that territory? Mm. Um, became one of the um, sort of shaping rubrics for that exhibition. And I like your title very much: Rock, Paper, Scissors, Positions in Play. Very powerful. Oh, thank you. Was that well, also around this? I'm, I'm surprised you did not use a cricket analogy for your title. Well, no. So in my in my sort of uh, in my um, the curatorial text for it, I, I picked on three games. Uh, cricket was, of course, one of them. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, another one was uh, Tai Chi and 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 this practice of pushing hands, hmm. where where you're trying to sort of you know you you you're playing with a partner or an opponent. And you have one point of contact and you're trying to feel um, the sort of, you know, the, the, your opponent's center. And then you push, you, you kind of, when, the, when you can sense it, you can push them off balance. Hmm. Uh, and that's, so that idea of pushing hands is something I've always found really attractive. Also hmm. within the art world is how do you push hands uh, with, you know, bits of institutions, things that may not be quite perfect. No, do you say do you say hands off or do you dive in and try and find it off balance? And that's always appealed to me. And that possibility to try and intervene and, and kind of push or pull or um, that. And the third game was actually rock, paper, scissors. Wow. Um, and I'd read some time ago, I mean, and rock, paper, scissors is interesting because one, it's this global game, you know? So it's a Japanese game made popular by the Chinese and you can find it, you know, kids in Everywhere. America playing it, you know? So it's that. Two, it's it's actually it's really all it's completely democratic, you know, in in the sense that there isn't an inherent, you know, you can't say, oh no, I'm going to be rock. Uh, you say, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll be paper. So it's it's in the play itself that that uh, that something happens, position change, uh, and 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 not there isn't an inherent advantage. If you're six feet six, it doesn't mean that you can serve your tennis. Uh, you know, you'll be a much better server than if you're five foot. Uh, two, you know, it's both of them true. can play rock, paper, scissors, uh, like that. And many years ago, um, a, a Japanese sort of uh, billionaire uh, couldn't choose between, uh, you know, Sotheby's and Christie's. So he got them to play rock, paper, scissors for his. Of course uh, he did. Yeah. And, um, and I think it was scissors one. Uh, very clever. And tell me, Hamad, so this, um, the UAE Pavilion, this invitation, as you mentioned, was right after you were coming back from the Asia Art, Art Archive in Hong Kong and making the move towards London. Is that right? Well, not quite. It, oh. um, it was, it, you know, I was still in Hong Kong. Oh, and, you uh, were? Okay. Yeah. I thought you'd already thought about moving. All right. No, no, we thought about moving. In fact, I had moved. And the, and the move was, uh, I mean, Hong Kong was amazing uh, in mm. so many different ways, but, but particularly for me professionally. But um, our eldest um, son, he was, you know, he was coming to be a teenager. And it felt really important that he be home, you know, and that's mm. London. 
Um, and it felt like, okay, this was a very, you know, once we had that, once we figured that out as a family, it was a very simple family decision with complicated professional consequences. But we sort of, you know, decided we were moving. And then actually in that year of the move uh, was when the UAE Pavilion happened. So for, for six months, um, I was leaving this bizarre life where I was commuting from London to Hong Kong. Um, cause you know, we, of course we had to move by, by school, uh, school year time. Uh, and that was then made easier when the UAE pavilion thing, um, sort of happened. Cause then I could break my journey in the UAE every time, do a little bit of research, move on to Hong Kong, do the same thing on, on the, on the way back. No, that's um, great. Now tell me about your time in Hong Kong at the Asia Art Archive. And this was after you, I mean, you had your gallery in London. It was extremely successful. It was all going very well. You were settled there with your family and then you decided to move to Hong Kong. What was that like? Well, I mean, Hong Kong was, was amazing. And, um, and you know, there's always, um, uh, I mean, I was sort of headhunted for this role and there's always, mm. you know, that's always very flattering. Uh, and it's also interesting that people, uh, I mean, I, I sort of go to Hong Kong and we'd have a conversation um, it was interesting to see that people could see that the projects we were doing at Green Cardamom, uh, which were kind of exhibition-led inquiry, had research at its center. Uh, mm. And I was quite struck by saying, ooh, you know, we could be head of research. And then uh, I hadn't thought of myself in that, in that way. So then I went and bought a book um, that was brought out by an art historical research center, the Clark Institute. Uh, edited by their director of research called Michael Han Holly, and it said, "What is research in visual art?" Uh, and and well, you know, years us. later, years tell later, us. I what is research in visual art? I tell you, I mean, years <laughs> later, I um, actually did, a, did a, we organized a colloquium at the Clark, so I sort of worked with Michael Ann Holly, and and I sort of relayed this to her to say, you know, it was really reassuring to read that book cover to cover and find out that you guys don't know either. So that's okay. <laughs> you know, you know? So you're making okay. stuff up. So Definitely. I understand that completely. So, you know, cause that's kind of what you did as a consultant. So I said, okay, I could, I could do that. Um, so the, uh, the archive was set up by, uh, was co-founded by Claire Shu, who's also continues to be the executive director and, and Johnson Chang uh, in, two, in the year 2000. And it was really set up to try and address a, a lack um, for for um, art history research, uh, particularly around sort of recent art, you know, contemporary art. I'm I'm staying away from contemporary and modern because mm -hmm. certainly in in China these uh, divisions don't hold. Uh, so when we talk about the modern and 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 and, and as, as if it's a it's a fixed uh, referent, it's it's not really. It depends on where you are in the world. Um, so. The idea was to um, that Claire was really interested, and she was doing a master's at SOAS at the time, but she couldn't find anywhere to research uh, contemporary Chinese art. So it's like, okay, I'm going to build this institution. You know, you know the sort of the vigor of youth. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it, Zara. Uh, <laughs> is to say, I'm going to do it, and 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 then to a credit, to a great credit, she did. Um, but then, of course, over time, it's like, oh, it's going to be a comprehensive, and then within a year, you say, okay, well, what does that mean, comprehensive Asia? Uh, what does that look like? Um, so when I joined, uh, it was already going for 12 years, and I've often described my role as being, you know, this great privilege that this institution has been kind of building up muscle. And my job mm -hmm. was to come and flex it, you know, to figure mm -hmm. out what are we going to do and how. Um, and, and this is again where I think, you know, the sort of that consulting background really helped and is to think about, well, what is the Asiad archive? And what I could see was that it's actually, or it has the potential for three things. You know, there is, there is material content, these archives that are being digitized and that can be then shared. There is an infrastructure, so there's a physical library, there's staff, there's, you know, but there's also, uh, and that's something that we really sort of uh, beefed up, a digital infrastructure so that you can share this around the world. And then there's a community, uh, again, that community of interest. Uh, so who could, um, you know, what kind of practices could this fuel? Artistic, educational, research, scholarly, uh, and then that sort of creates this sort of dynamic 
uh, circle um, or a triangle where the community of, of, of users, the super users, are also the people who are generating content. Mm. Uh, and, and quite often they are not, they're not equipped and not interested in then hosting it in, in an infrastructure, but will happily share that with you. So then what, what we did, went about doing is to restructure ourselves so that that, um, that triangle could be made explicit uh, and, and sort of, you know, accelerated so that we could intervene in not just the, the geography, but the economics of doing research. Very interesting. And really then, again, creating a new center in Asia. Where well, it was already there. Linking um, into diff but just yeah. making it more explicit and linking into researchers and artists all over. Uh, completely region. and and also you know also just you know expanding sort of that that mode of working and and mm -hmm. also sort of leveraging it through partnerships you know that really the realization i mean i've i've talked about this with uh, the art historian karen zitsovitz uh in an issue of art journal where you know i've sort of called this idea an art history of excess you know so mm -hmm. art histories that go beyond singular art historians studying singular artists, you know, one object at a time um, to, to, you know, so that's a very sort of lives of the artist kind of, you know, Vasari model of art history. And I think it's, that's not enough. Uh, so I think we need, it. we need art histories that, that look at art in all its capacities, yes. not just as a commodity, but also as a, as a political urgency or as a philosophical inquiry, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and that requires a different type of, uh, of, of approach. Uh, and that approach also needs, you know, rightly challenge this sort of the nationalist or regional frames that, that are often placed because of either a museum structure or the academy structure on, on places. And I think for any of this, you know, you, you, it needs to be collaborative. Definitely. This 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 notion that this uh, you know great volume that appears every ten years or twenty years is going to revolutionize the field is, I think, kind of bogus. Um, and and I'm sort of uh, really interested in in how through collaboration, uh, through collectivity, you kind of short circuit this. Uh, and you create an infrastructure that looks different to what passes as art infrastructure, certainly in, say, the North Atlantic. I think, you know, sitting in Asia, it became very clear that, you know, there is no need to replicate the same models with their same flaws um, that, that are, you know, that we can see in London or New York or Paris. You know, why import them elsewhere? Why can't we just leapfrog? Uh, exactly. and go into some, a, a different mode of, uh, of organizing knowledge. Yeah, and then make, if you make our own mistakes or make your own positive changes, but at least you're doing it very specific for that region and very specific for those uh, issues that individuals on the ground are dealing with. Yeah, and... and Personalizing uh, and other, it. The other thing also is just to be, you know, you have to sort of respond to what the need is. Uh, exactly. Now, obviously... You know, I went into uh, Hong Kong thinking that, of, of course, you know, I'm I'm a non-Chinese speaking brown guy coming over from London. So, of course, I'm going to be looking here and I'm going to be looking at South Asia and you get to Hong Kong. And actually, uh, when I went around meeting uh, universities and you know, professors, there was this cry of, oh, we have no art history in Hong Kong. Oh, really? I like, Excuse me. You know, <laughs> this is a fifty five thousand dollar GDP per capita place. You have, you know, multiple uh, universities with faculties with multiple people teaching art history. Why don't you have art history in Hong Kong? Mm. Um, and and out of that then came it's like, okay, well, if that's the way the 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 the, the situation is, we have to kind of address that because mm. that has to be, uh, you know, AA has been in its its home is Hong Kong. So how could we sort of say we can take on an Asian mantle, but while we're, you know, folks teaching art history uh, are saying, no, no, we have no art history in Hong Kong. So anyway, so we, we, then, we then started in our way through collaborations to try and address that. Uh, we started a new module of, um, in collaboration with Hong Kong University of, of, of teaching art history at the archive. And so saying, oh, well, if, you're, if you don't have those books, well then, how do you then do your research to, to shape new books? Um, 
Similarly, we did a project with the Museum of Art to say, well, you know, if you, you've been collecting for 50 years, surely that's a kind of a history. You, you know, what can yeah. we what can we sort of, you know, get out of that? And then we set up, you know, actually one of the, the most ambitious archival project in AA's history, uh, the artist Habik Chun, who, who went around, you know, photographing, you know, around five decades of exhibitions in Hong Kong. So he'd go out and f shoot exhibitions every day, like six days a week. And so, so you have this huge body. Uh, that's the material out of which new histories can be written and should be written. How fantastic. And I want to actually very quickly move to another topic because I'm very conscious of time. And I want to ask you about Green Cardamom, where you also played a very important role in writing history of art coming from Pakistan. And I wanted to ask about that. I mean, there are other questions I'm dying to ask about the Asia Art Archive, but I know that even this was such an important project and I don't want to let us not talk about it. So no. this was your so first foray into the art world. Yeah, I mean, in I mean, uh, my first foray into the art world was sort of writing reviews, but but yeah, yes. but this was the first serious sort of stab at it, and it was coming in uh, from two different places. One was Anita uh, Dow, who also happens to be my wife. Uh, um, you know, we were kind of getting fed up in what used to pass for uh, international in in London. You know, at at that time, things are a lot better now, believe me. But at that time, if you had a German, a Swedish, and a you know an American artist, that was an international show. Mm -hmm. Saying, uh, uh, no, you're, no, no, that's not. That's a kind of a North Atlantic parochial show. Uh, so we were interested in trying to inject the view of the international that came out of the Indian Ocean into the Atlantic Ocean. So you've always uh, tried to do this in a sense throughout your career from the very beginning, is looking at not alternative histories, but history across the board essentially, whether it's art, whether it's culture or? Um, yeah, I mean, th that's a big, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, no, 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 I mean, I mean uh, from an art historical, sorry, art, yeah, art point of view. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of interested in wider, you know, art as part of a larger current. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very interested, I'm not a big fan of what I've sort of dismissively called the unhinged contemporary. You know, a contemporary which is free floating that has nothing to do with what with what went on before. Um, I think there's always something to do. It's just that Definitely. sometimes those hinges are not visible to people, and I'm interested in in you know opening up those hinges. Uh, so you know, we started Green Cardamom started as a curatorial collective, and we would do what you would now call pop up shows. Mm -hmm. um, and then with one of the sort of our public shows, uh, what came out of it was. Um, uh, we had got a little bit of sponsorship from the Rangoonwala Foundation, and 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 they said, oh well, you know, you should you should come and talk to us about the work you're doing. So we went to them very sort of gingerly about actually doing books about publications. Uh, one of the the first big projects was the the Karkhana project, which was actually the brainchild and conceived and delivered by Imran Qureshi, but it was shown in this tiny you know gallery up in Touchstones uh, in in Rochdale. But there was no catalog, uh, and it, was, it just felt like, well, how is anybody going to make sense of what this project is? Uh, so we started with a book. So we approached the foundation with saying, okay, you know, will you support our publications program? And they were like, well, we really like what you're doing, but you guys are just not ambitious enough. Go away and come back with something. It's like, whoa, that felt like a, that felt amazing, actually. So we did. We went back with the idea. So, you know, what we got was initial sort of uh, backing to say, OK, we will um, we will support, um, you know, for you, you guys for three years. So, you know, you, and, and in, again, that exuberance of youth and the naivety of the lateral entrance, I said, OK, I think the gallery should really support what we want to do. And our idea is to have this hybrid creature, mm -hmm. which will both be a gallery, but it also be a laboratory. To, to, to shape ideas, to, that, you know, to test them, and then to grow them, in, and, and then kind of intervene in public spaces, in, in the museums, in the universities. Um, and that's kind of what we did, which was kind of mad, because uh, what we were doing was really, we were trying to run two organizations on, on the budget on, uh, of one. So we were really mm. burning uh, both ends in the candle but it was also you know, kind of exhilarating because it And it, it was felt... so important. 
Yeah, I mean, that important stuff you find out later, you know? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's true. At the, time, yeah. at the time, you can't even think about how important something might be. You just kind of keep going. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so I was describing this mode of operation where mm -hmm. we are, um, so, we, you know, we're working with artists, but we're also shaping projects. And of course, yes. th that's not independent of each other because those projects, um, you know, it's not dissimilar from the process I was describing for the British Art Show, is that those projects are, you know, are being fueled by artistic practices. Um, so when we were doing Karkhana, for instance, um, um, which, which I described to you, and this was before we set up the, um, a physical space, it was really obvious to me that what, what this uh, exhibition needs is that contextual frame. Mm -hmm. um, and, because, and because there were six artists who collaborated by Courier um, uh, to produce this really wonderful body of work, but, you know, how do you actually begin to look at this? So it's obvious to me that oh, we need to look at it through multiple lenses. You know, there isn't one way of looking at it. So we commissioned a whole bunch of different uh, writers. Um, you know, to, to somebody was looking at it. So John Saylor was looking at it through the lens of, um, of Akbar's uh, Karakhana. You know, so ah, the political economy. Uh, so, you know, what you got for your painting is how much you paid these guys on a daily rate. You know, so if you want something that looks like this, you need to, you need, you need uh to up the rate. Uh, so that was very interesting. Or Virginia Wiles was looking at it through anthropological lens uh, to say, OK, well, how does tradition kept be kept alive? Well, through radical innovation. Oh. Um, and um, Salima Hashmi was just sort of laying out the land for how the, this sort of project developed. Um, we had sort of uh, Kamar Adamji and Sandhya Jain who were uh, working at the Met. Um, in you know, particularly around materials, around conservation. That's exciting to get all uh, so of these who, brilliant minds to contribute. Yeah, no, no, and 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 then Anna Sloan, uh, who was you know one of our real co-conspirators, the, the the sort of one of the founding members of Green Cardamom as a curatorial collective. So Anna and I wrote a piece looking at the Karkhana uh, project as a kind of lens, as a political lens to to look at that post 9/11 moment, uh, to look at that possibilities of art. Um, and, you know, and one of the real sort of, you know, buzz moments for me, because in, in terms of just the kind of interventions that I was interested in doing personally as, or, or and, and for the project, was then we got a, an email uh, a few months after the, sort of the book came out, the exhibition started in Aldrich saying, from, from UCLA, saying that they wanted to use that essay um, in their art history reader. And it's like, oh, interesting. whoa, so this is exactly, you know, that th what, this is yeah. what we were interested in is how do we intervene in these histories? Um, and that was, and out of that, con uh, that exhibition came the seeds for the next exhibition, which was called Beyond the Page, okay. that, looked, that looked at this idea of, well, what is this thing called miniature? You know, how, is it just a style? Is it just uh, because it's this big or... Um, and I had this idea of, you know, and, and that became the subtitle of the show, it was Beyond the Page of Miniature as Attitude in Contemporary mm. Art from Pakistan. And as to say, okay, what is this thing called attitude? And for the longest time, Anna, uh, who is really my co-conspirator in this, and, and people like, uh, you know, Hamra and Rashid and Imran Qureshi were, were, you know, really part of this conversation. Um, and, and she didn't buy this attitude business. And, and what it ended up being was then she wrote this magnificent uh, essay, which is in, 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 in the book, which kind of is like, well, Anna, you, you've kind of done it. You, you didn't swallow what I was saying. So she actually ended up really looking at so many different lenses, thinking about how mm -hmm. architectural space is imagined, um, looking at Aisha Khalid's paintings through the, through the lens of Yaoi Kusama's uh, installations or um, historic miniature painting and, and making the argument that actually look at space from an architectural lens. So they very naturally move into installation, mm -hmm. whereas normal sort of, you know, quote unquote, normal um, oil on canvas painters don't. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, it really opened sort of, you know, different ways of thinking and, and looking. And it also, 
because it was initially an exhibition that um, was at Asia House and Manchester Art Gallery and then toured different so places. So very strong institutions were involved as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was, um, it was actually a really big, ambitious exhibition. We had, you know, lots of uh, new commissions. Uh, and then when it toured to the U.S., it expanded. Because what we're also interested in is that historical conversation. Mm -hmm. So looking at people like, you know, Zahur al uh and Anwar Jalal Shamza, but also then in, in Pasadena, uh, the, one of the critiques was, well, you know, you really just stuck around that same bunch who went to the NCA uh, and did miniature painting or went through it. So I was also interested to expand it in places. So it included people like Ali Kazim or Faiza Butt, who are not miniature painters, but but use that, uh, use some of those techniques and, and approach to materials or uh, notions of intimacy or the kind of uh, encounters they set up for the audience. You know, the fact that you you need to kind of get up close and really personal uh, or or step back. Uh, that those kinds of strate strategies in their artistic practice. And it's so important to have a show like that, where you have such strong names, such, such strong practices, and yet they're all quite different and diverse. It really adds to the conversation. And th so this must have been the first time that many people were really looking at contemporary art coming out of Pakistan. Is that right? No, it was, a lot it of was, these institutions. Uh, yeah. I mean, what was really funny, I, I remember this very clearly, because uh, with Tarkhana, we... Um, the, the US version was co-curated by myself, Anna Sloan, and Jessica Howe at the Aldrich. Um, and we'd stuck to our guns because the, the full um, title was Karhana, a contemporary collaboration. Hmm. And, and Jessica afterwards says to me, listen, there is no, I, I, I didn't think that there's any way that we would get away with uh, a foreign word and six unknown artists <laughs> you know, on, a, <laughs> a, 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 on an exhibition. Um, and yes, I mean, it's at so what, one what do you point think it was? What do you think the draw was for all of these institutions? Apart from your very persuasive self, what Look, else do you the, think it was? The work was, was amazing. The mm. work was literally amazing, you know? So I remember very clearly on the train back from uh, Rochdale, I came back, I called Imran, and I said, this is amazing, but there's no way anybody is going to get this. Uh, mm. We have to do a book. And he said, yes, let's do a book. Uh, and of course, that means, you know, so for the next two years, we're trying to figure out how to do a book and you had to kind of reverse engineer it. Um, and, um, and, and and the only way a book was possible was if it accompanied a bigger show. So then that's mm. what we then shaped it. And the book was an accompaniment to that show. And there's also that post 9-11 moment. Then these were mm. artists in Pakistan, in Australia, in the U.S., um, so it felt like a very, um, it's actually, I mean, you know, you know, th these COVID times, uh, you know, you kind of think about that as again, as, as to how the world connects. Um, but yeah, no, no, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. And then Sounds while we were it. doing that, Yale sort of, sort of uh, university did a, did a study day on the show. Uh, and looking at, uh, you know, that exhibition, Karkhana, as an exhibition, as a lens through which to look at art and politics. Uh, and that was a real high, you know. So you have people like Sarah Soleri Goodyear, who would organize, you know, who was the sort of the, the head of this thing. But people like Jonathan Katz or Courtney Martin, who now runs the Yale Center for British Art. And, you know, or uh, Kishwar Rizvi, who uh, teaches uh, architectural history there, they're all in the audience popping questions at you. And I was like, wow. okay, this is what I want to do. You know, this whole, I, I spent really, about yeah. 13, Extending 14 the years trying to figure out, uh, you know, accounting, no, banking, no, consulting, no. It's like, okay, this curating business, this is, uh, <laughs> this is interesting. This is working out for me. Tell yeah, me, yeah. Hamad, what years was this? This was around 2005 onwards, right? Karkhana was, uh, was 2005 and it's, I mean, originally uh, Imran's project was realized as an exhibition up at Touchstones, I think in 2003. Okay. Um, and then it took a couple of years to then uh, get things together for the U.S. show. And then Beyond the Page was 2006-07 and then the U.S. version was 2010. Okay. Um, and that also then gives you, I mean, there's a, there's a Gujarati saying that if you're going to 
if you're going to eat an elephant, and apologies to all you vegetarians out there, if you're going to eat, eat an elephant, do or it in small lovers, bites. Huh? Yeah. Do it in small <laughs> bites. Makes sense. Uh, and that's quite often, and you know, green cardamom was this, it's tiny space. I, th I think you visited. Huh? I did. So, so a lot of, you know, so lines of control or drawn from life. Um, these are all exhibitions that grew out of, you know, out of this little tiny space, Very out of a small, small bite. Um, but often in collaboration with others um, and then sort of grew over time. Um, and, and, and then, you know, once those ideas grow, if the idea is large, it will find the space uh, that gives it expression. Uh, sometimes what you have, um, and I think it was um, officially in Weiss who expressed this very well, that sometimes, you know, uh, the art world has this problem. You have tiny ideas, but big art, you know, and, and some, you know, it's, all, it's often nice Yours to have the opposite. big ideas and a small space and yeah. then something, you know, and I felt like that about Keshad Archive as well, because, you know, you would you think about the name and you think about the projects and then people would go there and sometimes, you know, the first expression was like, really, this is it? When I mean, you have to think about Hong Kong <laughs> space, what can it be? And, you know, it's like, um, you have to f figure those things out. Yeah, that makes sense. Hamad, I wanted to ask you as well, you've emphasized publications quite a lot. And, you know, obviously the idea of the archive and research. And tell me a little bit more about the need for publications and also the need for preserving the archive. Because I think sometimes that gets lost and people perhaps don't realize how for future generations, perhaps even for thought processes, publications and archiving materials are so important and should be sort of, should be done properly. Would you like to give your thoughts on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, uh, publications were really fundamental to, you know, that's kind of where we started. I shared yeah. the sort of the Karhana story with yes. you. There was, the, as an exhibition, it already existed. So it's only because of the publication that you know had to kind of force. Okay, we're going to do another exhibition, mm -hmm. um, and and this was very much a, a founding principle. And and when we were doing the small little catalogs for uh, for our initial shows, we would invite writers, and we were quite, we would try to do it. You know, have two writers, one ideally who would be from within Pakistan, and one from without. So you have two different lenses looking at a okay. work. Um, so, so I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, say, Abid Ali Kazim. We had Asim Akhtar from within Pakistan yeah. and Eddie Chambers um, from from outside. And, uh, and, and, you know, really interesting and, and, you know, and it gives a certain density um, of material. Um, and, and similarly, so, you know, when I, I when we approached the Rangoonwala Foundation, it was for the publication program because, um, yes. And, and that was sort of rammed home to me. And we did a, one of our earlier shows was um, the artist Khadim Ali. Um, and at that time- He's also been a doing, guest here. Well, there you go. You're, <laughs> you're just notching them up. And he, um, and at that time I had I'd gone back to, uh, to school. Uh, I was doing post-colonial visual culture at Goldsmiths uh, as, uh, at that time as a postgraduate course. Um, and I remember, you know, some people came and I just asked them, well, what do you think? And, you know, this, you know, earnest um, fellow student of mine said, oh, I don't know. I'll have to read this and then I'll mm. tell you. And that was really, that was kind of a ka moment for me to say, oh, okay. So actually, if you don't have something to read, you actually can't see what's on, what's on the wall. Um, and that really sort of doubled down that emphasis of, of, uh, of the discursive, of the critical space. Yes, you can consume the commodity. Uh, you can match it with your curtains and hang it above your sofa or, or what have you. <laughs> but to enter the world of culture, um, you have to enter a discussion, you know, uh, a discourse. It doesn't have to be an art historical discourse. Um, and, and that was always great because, you know, the only art history that Anita will read is what she edits. Uh, so there was almost kind of a, you know, a no bullshit, you know, there was, you know, it's like, okay, if it's not clear, it's not interesting, it's not going to get into our publications. Uh, right, and that right. really was a really interesting filter to apply and to think about, and well, really, are we... 
it really levels the playing fields as well. It sort of gives viewers the ability to understand so much more than just perhaps what they're seeing. Understand the reasoning behind why you're doing the exhibition, the reasoning behind why the artist may have created the work, and I think open up so much more for them. And it's important to give them that information, and give them、oh, the opportunity.、Completely. I mean, and this was really rammed home to me in a project we did、uh, actually on on Shamsa.、Uh, so Shamsa,、um, you know, and a colleague has described, you know, has Shamsa. Is this?、Uh, um, I sort of eavesdropped when she was explaining to her then boss, who who runs the gas works, saying, "Oh, you know, this is Shamsa, and you know, Hamad, he's obsessed by this artist." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, so yes, there was an obsession. And I was just amazed that you know he's not in every institution in the world and and you know and shouting out from the rooftops.、Uh, and again, it became like people did not know how to enter that work.、Mm. Uh, and I got fed up of sort of knocking on doors and talking to museum curators to say, well, "Can't you see?"、Uh, to say, "Okay, well, you can't do it. We'll do it." You know, in、mm. our little elephant in small bites way. So we gathered a team.、Um, First of which, who was、um, Iftikhar, in fact, because you know I'd come across Iftikhar as an artist first,、um, and he'd done this essay in a really interesting、uh, volume edited by Corbin Mercer on calligraphic abstraction. And over a party roll in New York, I kind of you know climbed <laughs> into him saying, "How could you write this thing and there's no Shamsa?" And he was like, "Look, I, you know, yes, I know, but this was this, and I didn't have time, I didn't have resource, I didn't have archive, blah blah blah." I said, "Okay, we're going to do a project." I guess I didn't have archive was also something so important to Absolutely. highlight. Absolutely, completely. And then what we ended up doing, and、um, you know, for、uh, we don't have time for all of this, but in a in a in a previous episode, what I'd done, Rashid,、um, when he was setting up BNU, he managed to sort of you know twist my elbow and get me out to、uh, to do a semester worth of teaching in a month. For the first graduating、wow. class、uh, of BNU, and one of those students,、uh, an artist, you know, then was was did an internship with us, where she sort of gathered digitized material on Shamsa that was available, and that you know, and those were the days of discs. So the, we distributed it, to, you know, to to Iftikhar, who done some of the digitizing <laughs> himself. He done you know, photographed things、um, to Rachel Garfield, who curated the next show. To Amna Malik、uh, and Savita Abde, so these are the four people we'd invited for this project called Shamsa in Four Takes,、oh, and it was to say to look at the same body of work, but come at it from this.、Um, so, so there were, and we only realized two of these,、uh, and we produced these little tiny perspectives, you know. So, literally, you could print them out on A4. There were PDFs,、um, but what was important more than the form was actually the content. Um, and、uh, by by the time we'd done two, the, you know, I we moved to、uh, to Hong Kong. So, but then that project got taken up,、um, and then you know, a, a monograph、uh, then came out that Iftikhar edited. Those two expanded, you know, and then other people contributed. I contributed a text, and that then became. And Shamsa is in the Tate, at the British Museum, at the Met. Uh, at the Guggenheim, M plus.、Uh, so yeah, it's it's and it's actually the the it's that writing、um, has a huge you know. impact. It's very true. Ahmad, I'm going to pause for a second and just see if there are any questions because I feel as though I'm hogging up all your time, and I know we are running very very over. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Ahmad? Burning questions. Here's one. Someone is asking: When you produce work or an exhibition, is the thought of global impact on your mind that sort of pushes forward the exhibition that you're thinking about, or is it something that 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 just ends up happening? So you're receiving a compliment about how you have changed various global projects. Well, I think it's yeah. No, I mean I,、uh, I think one of the best things anybody said to me is I remember.、Um, When he has to do these art fair rounds, and you know, and we were showing the work of Muhammad Ali Talpur,、mm. um, and 
somebody in Hong Kong actually. Uh, and, and then I saw her the next year and I said, oh, you know, how are you enjoying that work? And she said, okay, it's the, uh, it's the last thing I see at night. It's the first thing I, I see when I get up in the morning. And I said, wow. wow. You know? uh, and that to me, I mean, that was a real impact. Now it's not a global impact. So I think, but if it changes the life of one person in a really meaningful way, that's, I think that's important. And I think that's we need to, deal. we need to care about that. Uh, and it doesn't need to be, everything doesn't need to be, you know, the same. Agreed. But Hamad, were you surprised um, by the impact or are you surprised by the impact that your work has had, by the responses that it has received? When you're putting together a show or even like looking back when you first started Green Card, I, mean, I know you were talking about big ideas and small bites, but do you still find it a bit strange that you have managed also through the exhibitions that you've curated, through the projects that you have led and pushed forward and collaborated upon to really transform a lot of the narratives that are both coming out of not just Pakistan, but other regions of the world as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, let me answer that in a couple of ways. One is I don't think, you know, any one person, whoever they are, however brilliant, however well-resourced can, can do it, you know. Mm, it, alone. To, to, to actually make any substantive change, uh, it needs to be a collective effort. Of course. And, and one of the, you know, great things to see is actually just the density of people, you know, uh, now working in their ways. Uh, so one of the things that we did um, when I was at Asia at Archives, of course, yes, you know, so the big project may have been Hong Kong or, you know, whatever else, and we didn't have huge budgets and particularly, you know, getting things funded in say a place like Pakistan. So what we tried to do is to, to pick again, these little bites to say, okay, well, what could we start and with whom? Um, so we started with say an archival project for say something like Wahab Jafar. So Wahab, who as this amazing, well, as an artist, collector, patron, really a supporter, he was an ecosystem all by himself. And he had these wonderful sort of scrapbooks of artists that he followed. And that would include, for Ahmed Barwais, not only does that include uh, newspaper clippings, but it also includes letters, even a copy of, uh, you know, a, um, a passport that had gone out of date uh, of, of Ahmed Barwais, you know, was, was kind of in there. And it's wow. like, what, you know, so that is just an amazing treasure trove. Um, so an we important resource. That. And, and, and then it was like, okay, how do we fund any of this stuff? Uh, and then part of, you know, what we were doing is we were inviting uh, artists to come in and spend time at the archive and, and to also think about how they could use the archive in different ways. And one of the people we first invited was um, Iftikhar uh, mm. in both his capacities uh, as uh, what the deal we did was to say, okay, for a month, you'll be a professor of art history and work with us on, on projects that we're doing and think about wow. it. And for a month, you will be an artist and think about what you can do. Say, with, with, he was very excited about neon because you can imagine Hong yes. Kong is a neon city. And if you can do neon in Chinese characters, Urdu is no problem. Hmm. Um, so it, that, and, and, and long story short, uh, Cornell Library ended up uh, you know, funding um, the rest of the Wahab Jafar archive and started us on the Salim Hashmi archive. So again, it was these, these people who can, um, who can open up large windows. Uh, so it's not just their own practice. So it's not Vasari's lives of the artist again, you know, to say, okay, this is what I did and this is what I did. These are people who open up scenes for you. You know, through Wahab, uh, Salim Apa, you know, uh, their through contributions these collaborations. are vast. Yeah, Through these collaborations, just all of what they've done, forward together. their, their writing, true. what they've collected, what they, what, and, and, what, and, and the generosity of it. Uh, and that then kind of continued. Uh, and out of that, I mean, and the way I make exhibitions as well, it's, also, it's always never, never quite know where you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of, it can be frustrating for people because I, I you know, remember with the pavilion, people were getting very nervous as to, because it was taking me months to even select the final artist. I didn't go in saying, here is my list, you know, because that had to also come out of, of visiting people, talking to people, you know, shaping the show. And it was like, oh, well, we didn't understand what you were do, you know, doing, but now we can see it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I sort of, after the show was done, we could said, well, actually, just to share this with you, I I couldn't see it myself either. But it's actually in the making um, that that something happens. So that process and is very important. Yeah. That is, you know, that that is the process. Because if you knew exactly where you were heading, it would be really boring destination yeah. to go to. It definitely would. Hamad, I'm so sorry. My horrible phone is about to die, and I do not, I don't want to wrap this up. But I think we may need to. But thank you so much for taking out an hour and a half of your time. I'm so delighted. I can't even tell you. Uh, it's been a pleasure.